more like a very good advice. Um, stop coding websites, start assembling killer web experience with Drupal. They also say, come for code and stay for the community. But apart from these good advices, we will learn more on how Drupal works in practice from Brian House. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Drupal, hopefully uh, educate you a little bit about who's using it, how it works, and how to get involved in the Drupal community. Um, how many people here use Drupal today? Anyone? All right, a couple hands. All right, good. So this will be great. This will be good, uh, a good intro. So when we look at the market, we're really seeing a revolution that's going on in terms of how open source is changing how people build websites and how Drupal, specifically the Drupal project, is being adopted um, for websites large and small. In fact, this week in Munich, I just came up here from Munich for the day, um, there's a Drupal developer conference, DrupalCon Europe, with 1,800, almost 1,800 developers that are doing Drupal code all uh, for five days this week. The conference is three days. We had a code sprint on Monday, and then there's code sprints all day Friday as well. So there's a very, very large global community um, of people working on Drupal. I don't think that's me. Um, so um, you know, we do we do surveys every uh, um, every few years about why people use Drupal, and lots of reasons come up. But overall. The most important thing for Drupal, there's going to learn a lot about the technology, the things you can do with it, but it's really about joining the community and being participating in the open source community because it's really not about the bits. It's about the people that are active, that participate, that go to Drupal cons and do amazing things with Drupal. And so not only do they build websites, they build Drupal Easter eggs, we have Drupal bacon, we can do SpaghettiOs, people make and wear Drupal socks. Sometimes they don't wear anything else but Drupal. There's Drupal graffiti. People wear Drupal with spandex. Not something I recommend, but something you can try. We have jack-o'-lanterns. We have Drupal beer. We have balloons. We have Drupal tattoos. We even have Drupal cookies. So there's lots of fun, amazing things that people who have a passion for doing amazing things on the web, there's a reason they come to Drupal and they contribute to the community as part of that. And really, the community is what makes the difference between just technology and creating a really amazing open source project. You know, when we look at the Drupal open source project, there's over 800,000 people that are registered on Drupal.org. There's over 17,000 modules or plugins that you can add to Drupal. So the common refrain in the Drupal community is, how do I do something? How do I integrate with Pinterest? How do I integrate with Salesforce.com? How do I um, push out to a mobile app? And the answer is always, there's a module for that. And every module in the Drupal world is imperfect, but it gives you a place to start so you don't always have to start from scratch and do it yourself every single time you want to do something. Most importantly, we estimate there's about a million and a half, maybe two million websites running on Drupal. Um, and people are doing some really, really cool things. But overnight successes don't, start, don't happen overnight. They take years in order to gain the momentum to get people involved and to care about it and to show the kind of passion that we just talked about. So Drupal was founded by a guy, Drew Spittard, he's a Belgian. Um, he's from Antwerp. He founded the Drupal Project. He founded my company, Acquia. I'm the vice president of product marketing at Acquia. He found, founded another company, guys a lot of free time, I think, called Malum. He's also president of the Drupal Association. He's very smart, has lots of uh, degrees. But this is what Dries looked like in uh, 1999 when he started the Drupal project. He's in his dorm room. He's sufficiently geeky on the shelves. He has both his uh, Java coding books and his stamp collection. He took to college with him, so uh, his, geek, his geek street cred is real. And he started this as a project at, uh, at his school, uh, University of Ghent, just as a way to collaborate and communicate with fellow students. And he started it in 99, and it had some success, and lots of students used it. So when he graduated, he said, what am I going to do with this thing? Dries was a uh, contributor to the Linux project. He was involved in open source. And so in 2001, he released, this is the uh, announcement he made when he released Drupal um, for the GPL license for anyone to participate in and to share and use. A little manifesto there, but he kicked it off. And this is what Drupal release 4 looked like in 2003. 
and they, they had their very first DrupalCon in 2005. And uh, Drew, Drew's was funny because he's like, you know, I put a post to that on the Drupal.org, the community page, that, hey, if you want to come work on Drupal with me, show up this weekend in Antwerp. And he's like, I didn't really expect anyone to show up. And lo and behold, 30 people showed up. And they went and spent four or five days. And he was sort of like, I didn't know what to do because I had to entertain them for an entire weekend besides, uh, you know, working on Drupal. So they went out to a couple of bars. And really the, the essence of the social community as well as this focus on the future of the web and the technology that drives Drupal has really started here and, you know, in some of these very humble, ad hoc things that he did to start the community. And then a couple years later in Boston, this is my first DrupalCon, we had 800 people. Then the next year in DC, we had 1,400 people. Then in San Francisco, we had 2,700 people. Chicago, we took over an entire hotel, we had 3,200 people. It was a Drupal hotel for a week. And as I mentioned, this week we're in Munich. Next year, uh, later this year, we're going to Sao Paulo, so that'll be my first DrupalCon in uh, South America. So something I'm looking forward to. So. The question then becomes, okay, that sounds great. There's all this really interesting sort of social aspect of Drupal. What can you do with it? So Drupal is used by lots of organizations, lots of organizations big and small around the globe. Um, it has 55 supported languages and has very strong internationalization and multilingual skills. So there's a lot of multilingual sites as well. So we use it from astronauts in space at NASA to global artists like Bruno Mars from global personalities to global causes, people as part of the United Nations. Global institutions right here in Germany, Mercedes won an award for using social media to build uh, marketing communities. This is uh, uh, replacing focus groups for uh, uh, finding out about new car advertising. This was a uh, community of young sports car drivers from the ages of uh, 15 and 45, and they built a whole social network for them. To local information, this is from uh, Montevideo in Uruguay. To location aware data, this is a responsive design built by a customer of ours, Florida Hospital. They're the largest processor of patients in the United States. They're in Florida, there's a lot of old people there, so they need to go to the emergency room a lot. Turns out you don't need to figure out what the wait time at your emergency room is at your desk very often. That's usually a bad sign if you're at your desk, like, oh no, I gotta go to the emergency room. However, when you're on the road, that's when you always have to go to the emergency room. So what they did is they built a responsive design with GOIP lookup in it. And so when you're on the road and you have an emergency room, it tells, knows where you are, where the nearest emergency room is. That's the red bar, the top on the mobile device and the bottom on the, on the browser. And what the, nearest, what the wait time is at all those emergency rooms. So you can go to the one fastest. You don't have to stand there and wait in line for three hours. We have global communities, Twitter, eBay, Intel, LinkedIn, all build their developer communities on Drupal. Semantic, their customer support community built on Drupal. To local institutions like Duden here in uh, Germany. And global brands, uh, Pfizer uses Drupal to uh, run their brand sites for things like chapstick.com and then also publish all the same content off across multiple social channels including Facebook in an automated fashion so publish it once and deliver it anywhere. So local enterprises like uh, the, the 2DF uh, television network here in Germany. And we cover news, technology, politics, and even the Olympics. The, uh, all of the, uh, in the United States anyway, uh, NBC Universal is one of our biggest media companies. They did all of their uh, live, responsive design, mobile applications all on Drupal. So the only way to watch live streaming in real time a video from the Olympics was actually on their mobile apps, um, all built in Drupal. So it just gives you an idea of the size, the scale, and you know, some of the complexity that people are, and the interesting things that they're doing with Drupal. Um, so it, it, it's a really powerful platform that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility to build the right web experiences for your customers and your clients if you work at a web development shop, for your company, or for you as an individual, for your hobby groups, your church, um, your kiteboarding team, or whatever else that you might be interested in. And like I said, we estimate that there's more than uh, 1.5 million Drupal websites we have this uh, website called Drupal Showcase. You can search by type of website, 
by industry of we websites as well as by country who's using Drupal and anyone can submit a website to it. Um, but it's a nice way if you're thinking about using Drupal, you can answer the question, who else like me uses it Drupal? Who else in Germany uses Drupal? Who else in financial services? So it's a nice, a nice asset for that. So talked a little bit about the community. We talked a little bit about some examples of Drupal in action. So what is this Drupal thing? Um, it's an open source project. There's a core called Drupal Core. It's on the seventh major release. And then there's, as I mentioned, 17,000 modules. And that's nice, and you can do lots of stuff with the code. But really, Drupal is about managing content and users and then delivering that to the right experience. So you can create the websites and the web experiences and applications that make sense for your organization or your clients or your brand. You know, when we talk to organizations, you know, the challenge isn't how do I build a website? It's how the hell do I deal with my 500 websites and my 15 different CMSs? We talked to a global pharmaceutical company, 600 websites, they estimated 60 different CMSs somewhere in their organization. The Florida hospital, they had 108, uh, they had 80 websites outside their firewall. They had 150 websites inside their firewall. They estimated they had about 20 different technologies, some of which they owned inside the organization managed, some of which agencies, digital partners owned. They had no control. And so what that means is that they have lots of websites, but lots of websites just means lots of different technologies, lots of things to train on, lots of complexity for the, the IT to manage. It's expensive, it's hard to use, it's complex. And so, you know, when we talk about Drupal within large organizations, within enterprise, with our clients, you know, oftentimes we're not competing against the Typo 3s or the WordPresses of the world. We're competing against Adobe or Sitecore out of uh, Denmark or SDL Tridian. And people are used to still buying these lot proprietary technologies to build their websites and to build their CMSs. And what that means is information's locked in silos. It's incredibly slow to innovate. We've had companies that tell us that it takes three, four months to build a website in the Oracle product for uh, websites. And they're an Oracle shop. They've you know, spent millions of dollars a year with Oracle. But their marketing departments can't wait three to four months to build a website. I need a website next week for a promotion we're going to kick off. So they started using Drupal to, uh, to start building those websites. Turns out marketing doesn't really care what technology you use. Just give me the website when I need it. They kicked out Oracle, um, and they're using Drupal now across the board, across the entire organization. And it's expensive to use these technologies. Um, and so open source and Drupal, we found, is to be a better way to help them achieve their objectives. Because open source and Drupal are about freedom. Freedom to run the program, freedom to study the program, freedom to modify and redistribute that program. You know, I work at a company, Acquia, we're a commercial open source vendor. We don't have an enterprise version of Drupal. We don't have a proprietary version of Drupal. We don't have the one we charge you for. We support Drupal, the open source project. Whatever you run, we support it. And so that means that there's only one version of it. So everybody can participate in that community, contribute it, and build from it. And because of that, that means the pace of innovation is incredibly fast. You know, the latest example we use is uh, Pinterest. There was an article in February this year, Pinterest had hit 10 million users in like six months. And so the question always is, well, how fast, you know, people start asking, how fast are you going to have a Pinterest model, module for Drupal? Um, you know, if you went to Adobe and said, how, when are you going to integrate with Pinterest? They're like, yeah, yeah, it's on the roadmap, maybe in two years we'll get to it. Within two weeks, there was a module uh, in the Drupal world for Pinterest. And within the four weeks, it was in use on dozens of sites. And this pace is really, really critical. I had dinner uh, on Monday night with a guy who's the chief digital officer for NICE Euronext. They run, he runs the websites for all the exchanges across Europe and the New York Stock Exchange in, in the States. The thing that matters to him the most on his job is how fast they can build and deliver websites to his business stakeholders. Not about um, any of the technology bits, it's about how fast he can move it. And so this pace of innovation is critical um, in order to succeed as people, as the web moves faster. I mean, we're places here like Campus Party, the web's moving right before our eyes. You need an open source project and a project like Drupal to keep up with that and to help participate in that. 
We also talk about Drupal as assembled web experiences. When you have 17,000 modules, this is really about where, you know, where the focus of this talk is, is it's not about writing everything from scratch. It's not about you know, just uh, uh, start writing code and, you know, and constantly doing everything from the ground up. There are a lot of great web application frameworks, and they can build amazing applications. But if you're using them to do something like build a website, you're going to be doing the same thing over and over again when you're building using the, a framework. And so Drupal abstracts it up a layer, gives you modules, enables you to plug and play pieces, create sort of a repeatable foundation. So that way the amount of work to uh, complete any individual website gets smaller and smaller. So Sony Music, for example, they have 350 Drupal websites. And they're, you know, they have about 100 of those that they can instantiate in a matter of minutes and roll out in a, matter, in a couple of days. Just put a design in, simple content. Those are one and two, three page websites. Then they have a whole other la layer of sites that are template based. They don't change much. It's just a color change. Some of the pictures changes for about another 100, 150 artists. And only about 10 or 20 of their, ar their artists justify having a completely custom web experience for every artist. And so Drupal en enables them to do this and to do this at a scale that makes sense for their business. And it's open source so it lowers costs. Now, the reality of open source, of any open source project, not Drupal or any others, is Drupal is neither free as in beer nor free as in speech. Drupal is really free as in puppies, right? I have a free puppy for you. But now you have to care for it and feed it and take it to the vet. It's going to cost you money. And so when you, whether you're selling to a client or you're building a site for your own organization, being realistically about what those costs are and how they compare, what Drupal doesn't do, though, is any open source project doesn't do, is it doesn't impose a tax on you, a license tax that goes into the vendor's pocket for no, for not for any benefit of yours, or for you or for your clients. So you can save in a lot of ways. And then if you can deploy, build and deploy sites faster, without as much custom code, without starting from scratch, that's also going to reduce your implementation times and your development costs. Now, from an architectural perspective, Drupal has what we call the, uh, a node-based architecture. So Drupal consists of nodes, and nodes consist, can be lots of different things. Nodes can be blog posts, they can be wikis, they can be news articles, they can be press releases, they can be images. And so what happens with Drupal is because you manage these at a very atomic scale, what happens is you can create references to those nodes. And so you can create relationships between content nodes. Um, you can also mix and match them. So Drupal has a concept called views, which is, think of it as a uh, list builder, a, seri a SQL query builder. But it enables you to create lists of information and then to define the display of that information. So you can make it in a table that's ranked by ratings, for instance. You can create that list of uh, information and within seconds create a, uh, expose it as XML or RSS and then import it and integrate it into a map, a mapping application or some other application. You can display it as a grid, BobDillon.com. If you go there and look at his uh, album discography, this is a Drupal view and it's all pictures of all his albums. So these are things that don't take any coding to develop. You can do in a matter of minutes very, very easily, and then you can just focus on styling them and creating the experience you want. In addition, this really positions well for Drupal for mobile-first applications. Because the content's so componentized, you can mix and match it in lots of different ways and then display it in different contexts that make sense. So it could be personalized content for a user. So me as a logged in user gets a different view of content than you as a logged in user. It also makes it really easy to mix and match content for display across multiple different form factors. There's actually a, a really interesting project going on right now in the Drupal community called Spark. And what you can do from a single admin page layout uh, uh, page is you can actually define all the form factors that you're going to do build your responsive designs for, and from a single page, figure out where all your breakpoints are and how the page layout goes from each one of those. So you can do smartphone, Android tablet, iPod tablet, desktop application, and define all of your page layout elements all in from a single screen before you even start your design work, accelerating responsive design and app development. On the user side, Drupal manages users that has concept of custom roles, and it has a very, very granular permissions model, so you can create as many custom roles as you need to create social communities, social websites, different interaction layers. There's private information that's only view viewable to certain people on the site. Um, and you can create as many custom roles and permission sets as you need to to support your web needs. 
And so this is one of the things that we kill the proprietary vendors when we compete against the, you know, the open tax or oracles or adobes of the world. They don't have this. This enables social application development. And they don't have this in the granular way that Drupal has. So it makes it much, much easier to create social applications, which is why we see all the developer communities built on Drupal. So from things like content authoring, you can, you can add WYSIWYG editors, you can make it very easy for the editorial teams that live and breathe on the websites that you build for them, make it an easy experience for them. As I mentioned, NBC Universal does the Olympics websites. Their customer within NBC, they run it for all of their shows, they have 70 different shows, they have, I saw an ad for the Sci-Fi Network in, uh, in uh, um, Air Berlin Magazine today, so Sci-Fi, all, all of their uh, programs run on this. But their customer for the developers on the web are the editors that live and breathe and push content to the website each and every day, making it easy for them. I'm going to even show some drag and drop page layouts to make, uh, show you some of that flexibility. We have uh, content approvals and editorial workflows. You can see a personalized view of the content you create and create a whole uh, simple workflow experience around that content. Drupal has a uh, theming layer that makes it really easy to separate the presentation of information from the storage and management of that information. So this is a, a, a layer that you work in CSS and PHP code to define your site layout, your page layouts, and then manage CSS to define the style elements on the page. And the separation of content makes it really easy to mix and match that content, as I mentioned, and also create the right experiences um, <clears throat> for users on your site. And then Drupal has a very rich services layer. So any of the information that you can manage on a web page in Drupal, you can also push out via services. So, so it'd be XML, RSS, JSON, to be consumed on social channels. So you're pushing Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. You can automate all of that. So one click, not only does it go to the website, it goes to all those social channels. You can make web applications, um, a uh, mobile applications very easy. So you can push content out to iPad devices, and so we call this headless Drupal, right? Because the consumption mechanism on a tablet or a smartphone isn't Drupal. It's a, you know, an app built in PhoneGap or an Accelerator or a custom app you built yourself. It's Dru Drupal's just pushing the content there. There's, a, uh, there's an organization, a company in, in the U.S., I'm not sure if you guys know it, called Gilt. They're uh, sort of a shopping site. And so they have iPad apps, iPhone apps, they have web apps, they also have email delivery of all their content. You get an email every day, hey, Converse shoes are on sale for 20 bucks, buy Converse shoes. Um, they manage all of that content in Drupal and then push it out dynamically across all of those channels, all through the service layer architecture. So it makes it really easy for developers to extend the reach of their content beyond the website and create really, really compelling mobile applications. So you guys want to uh, see a quick demo, see some stuff? That makes sense? All right, cool. I'm going to switch mic. Uh, Ubuntu machine as well. So full stack installer gives you the full LAMP stack and then uh, you can uh, build sites on this. So what I have here is a, uh, is a Drupal website um, and what I'm going to do is look at the, some of the content editing tools as well as the page editing tools. So the first thing I have is a, a sort of drag and drop page design. So if I want to do something like customize the layout, right, I have a two column layout here, I got a block and then just sort of a list of content. I can come in, click of a button, see all the different page layout options. So I can go from two page, two column, I can switch my columns, change my sidebar, save it, column page. So it makes it very easy to change some of the dynamic elements. You know, this is obviously a pretty simple website. If we had lots of blocks and elements on this page, you there's a lot you could do with that. In addition, what I can do is I can actually customize this page, right? So I click to uh, customize the page uh, elements, and what I see here is I can uh, um, I have drag and drop elements, so I can move them around. Um, I'm gonna move this back over to the block. Let's move that element here. I can add new content to this page. So I come in, click add new content, and I see different types of items. 
or I can see sort of my list of things that are already styled and pre-designed for this. So I can come in here and see a list of different types of elements that are already exist on the page. So I have a slideshow here. So I can come in, look at that. All right, that looks interesting. I can add the slideshow. I can say how many, you know, make some tweaks to how this looks. Do I want to show the full content? I don't actually in this case, so I want to show a teaser. So I'm going to do this, finish it up. And now I have a slideshow. And you know what? I want that slideshow to be at the top of the page, so I can just drag it up. Put it right there. So now, then I hit save. So now it makes it really easy for site assemblers, site builders to come in and make changes to a page without writing code um, or doing, you know, going to sort of some arcane administrative menu in order to, to control my page elements. Second thing I'm going to do is go over and look at some of this content. So I can do some of the similar things here. If I hit the panelizer button, um, I can change how like the elements on the page. I can do the same thing with layout. So I can change it around. Very easy, st straightforward stuff. Um, so I can do that on a content by content basis, right? So you can imagine a publisher or an editor needs to submit content. There's two photos instead of one. Now they need to change the page elements because they want to use both photos. So this gives them an easy way to do that right in this interface without having to call an IT administrator or somebody, you know, submit a ticket to change that, um, which typically happens. The other thing in here is I can come in and I can uh, edit content very easily. So, you know, I can change my, uh, um, you know, or campus party. I can come in, I Drupal has a concept of clean URLs, so I can give it a human readable URL, which makes it easier for the search engines to, uh, to add. I've got a WYSIWYG editor here. If I want to go to uh, um, HTML, I can add in HTML. Drupal th supports things like tokens and other stuff. So there's a lot of flexibility in here. Um, gives it, I can manage revisions on this content. So if I want to make a change and then we don't like it, my boss doesn't approve it, I can revert that change if we're going lightweight from a menu perspective. I can even add it to the menu item very easily. Um, so I can do that right here. I can also tag this information with different uh, meta tags and meta descriptions for, uh, for uh, um, pick up by search engines. Drupal supports the uh, Facebook open, uh, open graph. So you can tag information with metadata so it displays correctly on Facebook very easily. It gives you some nice, easy ways to, uh, to save this content. And then, uh, so it gives you some ideas of some of this different stuff here. So it makes it really easy for someone who's creating content to live in this, nice, easy user experience to edit it. And we're actually improving a lot on this so that way someone who's not technical can come right in here click an edit button and edit right on this page without having to go to another screen. They just want to do it right in context, so we're doing that as well. The other thing I wanted to show, I mentioned <clears throat> a little bit more sophisticated, is when you have to create uh, editorial workflows and sort of personalized views of information. So this is a, uh, a website. This is a, um, I have a content editor coming in. It's a, it's a social type website, so there's some interactions with people but it's also publishing content out to a community. So right now on this website, I'm logged in as I'm a writer. So as a, I'm a writer, I see my profile, I see users that I can follow, and I can, I can track a list of those. This is a personalized page with my news, my stuff. I even have my picture of the office that I work in. It happens to be in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I can come in and choose this. I could actually change that. Say if I move to New York, I move to the New York office. I can come in and change this. Um, very, very easily. Um, now, when I'm a writer, the way she works is she does, she works from her workbench. This is her workflow uh, uh, view. So from, um, from this view, what she sees is all of her work that's in progress. So work that's out for review is either has been published or hasn't been published, as well as a list of recent content that's been submitted to the site. So making it easier for her as a content creator on the site to create information, submit it to the site in sort of a dashboard view. You know, there could be a thousand people contributing code on this site. And so you don't want to see all of their information. You just want to see the information that's relevant to you as a content contributor. She wants to create content here. She can come in and, and she has a <coughs> subset of content that... Uh, what about the control? That she can create. So she can create polls, add media. 
but she can create a news item. And so one of the things that's an example of a module at work, so we have a news item, it's a content type. This is, you know, I can create this in a wizard-based interface, no programming, very easy to do. I had text formats, I had tags, I had medias. This is a field I define once and then I can reuse throughout the site. But what I have here is a module <coughs> called Zamanta. So this is a third-party module, exists for a system that does content recommendations for people who are writing content, gives you real-time recommendations on the fly. So I'm a writer and I'm gonna write a, a news article about campus party in Berlin. So I'm a, a, I can type. Now, if she wanted to uh, um, do this in multiple languages, she can. So she can pick what her primary language is. She can actually go to an existing piece of content and create versions in other languages and then edit those or send it for translation as part of a workflow process to, so a translator can translate it and then and go through review and publish it back. I'm going to keep it neutral. And I can say things like uh, here at... And so what I can do is just by typing in content here, I can come in here and look at this module and hopefully this will work. And it's analyzing the content that I have right in my text body field. And then what you see here are slides from today's keynote that's published in live, right? Because I'm tying in the gallery. So these are slides published today from the airport, from, you know, so if I wanted to do Tempelhof Airport and add a link, I could just come over here and say, Copy image URL, paste my image, done, right? So how many, anyone who has a smartphone, anyone who's used Facebook can do that, right? That means anyone can edit your web, the website on your page. I was at a Fortune 10 company, global company, one of the biggest companies in the world. Sitting down with their digital marketer, they win awards for all the great stuff they do on their website. She can't do that on their corporate homepage, on their .com site. They have to submit content in a Word doc to an IT organization who writes it up as XML to post to their website. This is the reality for most organizations in the world. This is an amazing jumpstart. So you get an idea. Here's a third-party plugin. We dropped it into a site. We created a nice piece. We rolled it in. Very, very easy. Pretty cool? Right on. I'm not going to save it because when I saved it earlier when I was practicing my demo, it crashed the site. So. Imagine if I save that. So if I come in and I can log in, this is just a tool for demos. I'm going to log in as a, I think as an administrator. So what we see here, so I'm a different user, different user profile, knows who I am though. That's nice, I'm getting an error, that's fine. Gave me a different view of this information. Now it shows me a different picture because my preference is a picture. It's a different one. This is, you know, now I'm Chris Yates, so I work in Burlington. This is my picture, my personal view of the information. I follow different users. The content I've created is different here, my news. So again, created an easy, personalized view of this of, of my uh, website, my experience. Very easy to submit content. This is just scratching the surface of what you can do in Drupal, but I wanted to show some, some relatively cool things just to give you a kind of a flavor of types of things you can do with Drupal to complement just the screenshots. So, makes sense? Pretty cool stuff? All right. Uh, sure, hold on, let me go back.
user site assemblers, if you will, so that way you can get new sites to, to, to market faster. But the problem, you know, there's a lot of app, uh, uh, situations in which, it, which a completely custom build from the ground up makes a ton of sense. The challenge that we talk to organizations that are using Drupal is that they get in this problem really, really quickly when they do that. Lots of different tools, lots of different frameworks, lots of different technologies, so it becomes so cost prohibitive and expensive to do it. They, you know, they create this, this sort of perfect storm and they, then they're looking to say, hey, you know what, I want to wipe out all of those tools and standardize on one platform that gives me flexibility and there's always going to be edge cases. You can't solve for edge cases. That's, that's sort of not the, the point. The point is give me something I can standardize and I can build 600 websites if I'm a pharmaceutical company or 300 websites if I'm a, a media and entertainment company. And that's, I think that's the thing that Drupal does better than anyone. Just flip through it. Yep. Hey, this all looks familiar. So the question then, we talked saw a little bit about the demo. So how does it work? How does it work in the Drupal world? Ultimately, Drupal is an ecosystem. It includes web developers, architects, designers, partners, writers patient people, very, very technical people. Drupal's a very technical computer, uh, open source community and project as compared to other ones, compared to the Joomla's and WordPress's of the world. And ultimately, you know, Dries mentioned this on uh, yesterday in his keynote at DrupalCon. His goal is to make Drupal the dominant platform for building websites. And part of that is building the biggest ecosystem, because the ecosystem defines a platform that wins. The more people are using it, it sort of creates a virtuous cycle that drives this. And this is critical for customers, for you as web developers, for your clients that you build projects for, because it gives you choice. It gives you freedom. There's not one way to accomplish something. There's not one vendor to do everything with. By no means does everyone in the Drupal community have a relationship with my company. There's lots of ways to be successful with Drupal. Um, and that choice gives you a tremendous freedom. And a lot of this about in being open source is about the freedom that the platform provides. And so the way Drupal works is the way you build a, a robust and rich ecosystem, it's about the community. Drupal, there's local meetups almost everywhere in the world. Um, some, at, you know, every weekend somewhere in the world there's a meetup around Drupal. There's aggressive code sprints. They're doing uh, code sprints all this week in, Drupal, at, uh, in Munich. They write code. People get together all around the world to try, you know, expose new areas. One of the things that's happening in the Drupal world is we're uh, 
building Symphony, the PHP framework, into Drupal core for the next major release of Drupal. So there's been a number of sprints around that. People who are interested in Symphony and PHP come in and just jump in and volunteer and work for a weekend to write code um, for, for the Drupal project. There's regional groups, and then those groups are the people that drive camps. There's Drupal camps, there's uh, you know, hundreds of Drupal camps that are held every, uh, all around the globe um, all year round. Oftentimes those camps become summits that are sometimes targeted to business people to help business people understand the power and, and value of open source and why it's a ready tool and, a, and a, an appropriate tool for use in the enterprise as well as for developers to learn about Drupal like we are here. And then the Drupal cons um, that are, you know, get developers um, to come in from around the world to really spend serious time thinking and, and contributing to the project. Drupal is very, very active on IRC. There's a whole list of, uh, on Drupal.org of all the IRC channels, so it's really easy to get involved and get questions answered in a very ad hoc fashion. There are a tremendous number of resources that are available from APIs, from training, groups at uh, Drupal.org, groups that are based on where you live, interests you have. There's Drupal for Education, Drupal for Government, Drupal for Nonprofits. Localized Drupal, as I mentioned, is a really, really strong internationalization uh, community. Supports a lot of languages, and so very utilized uh, very heavily for multilingual sites. And then the uh, Drupal Association actually manages the community as a nonprofit. There's some great training resources around for Drupal, so if you're interested, um, there's a website, Build a Module, that does videos, and then you can buy videos from it. Uh, Lynda.com has videos. And then uh, also a service called Drupalize Me. They have like 500 hours of really, really deep hour-long training videos. So there's lots of different places to get started from a training perspective. And there are tons of books. Too many books to take screenshots of all their covers. So um, whether you're a, a lightweight Drupalist and you're going to read a book like Using Drupal, or you're a serious programmer and you want to use Pro Drupal development, there's a lot of great wealth of resources available out there to, uh, to help get you started. Um, and to learn about Drupal. But as uh, Nocha mentioned um, from the beginning, really the, the, at, the begin at the heart of Drupal, it's people come for the code, you can build amazing websites, and that's a great reason to go to drupal.org and download the software, but people stay for the community. Getting involved and participating and learning in a group environment is a great way. I mentioned lots of different ways to get involved. This is what's really special about Drupal, and this matters to organizations. The New York Stock Exchange, when they decided to go open source for their websites, 60 websites around the globe, they looked at a bunch of different open source projects and they ended up choosing the one that had the biggest, most active developer community that was actually participating in writing code. People don't know this, but Drupal has a developer community, people actively contributing code that's twice the size of the Linux project. So it's a great community. We certainly encourage you to uh, learn more and, and, and to participate and go build something extraordinary in Drupal. Thank you. Cool, so we'll do some questions. I've got a, hello? Yeah, Yeah, I can hear you. I've actually got a question for you. So um, I was thinking, what's the easiest way to get started with Drupal? Sure, so there's a lot of, uh, starting points that you can, uh, you can to, to get started and start playing with the code. So I showed you on my desktop, there's a thing called Dev Desktop. So it's a LAMP stack installer, one click. You don't have to go figure, configure WAMP or MAMP or any of the other desktop tools. That's really loud. Um, you can go to Drupal.org. If you understand, you have LAMP stack already installed in your machine, you can download um, a tarball, Drupal 6, Drupal 7, you can even do uh, alpha code for uh, future releases of Drupal. They also have distributions or packages of Drupal. So if you want to build an event website, there's a distribution of Drupal called COD. If you want to build a community website, there's a distribution called Commons. If you're a government agency and you want to do a government website, there's one called Open Public. So they package up a bunch of stuff in Drupal so that way you don't have to figure out which module do I use and how do I do this. It's already pre-packaged for you. You can start to hit the ground running. And there's also, uh, uh, my company has a SaaS product called Drupal Gardens. So let's say you don't, the thought of downloading and installing the LAMP stack on your, your local machine terrifies you and you don't want to manage code, you can go to drupalgardens.com and launch a free site and never have to touch any code at all. And take advantage of Drupal. So, lots of different places. 
Thank you. Are there more questions? Pretty sure I'm going to start here. Hi. Uh, I've got an e-commerce uh, startup, actually. Um, but just one question about your uh, about the community. I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm, I'm an organizer of TEDx events. I'm not sure if you've heard TED.com, mm -hmm. TEDx events. So a startup and, and TEDx organizer. So it's incredibly hard to start a community. Mm -hmm. So like, seriously, congratulations. Thank you. But once you have it, how do you actually maintain it? How do you keep the momentum? How do you engage them? And like, the question is, what's, what's there for them? Because you showed us some really impressive numbers. You know, I think Dries, who's the founder and project lead, you know, he's a, he, at the end of the day, he's a really a lesson in sort of crowd behavior and community behavior and management of that because he does an incredible job. He's not, a, he's not a forceful leader. He's not a dogmatic, let's go, rah, rah leader. He's actually very understated. Um, and, you know, his philosophy is coordination, not planning. So he doesn't come up and say, hey, we're going to do this, and here's the roadmap, and I need you to do it. He's like, hey, mobile's really important. What should we do about mobile? And he poses things out in the, into the community so that way the community can participate in the solution. And so this inclusiveness is, you know, drives how you set up meetups, how to get people to contribute and, and submit sessions to a DrupalCon. Um, I mean, our DrupalCons are conferences with 2,000 people that are completely organized by volunteers. And so, you know, now at the same time as we've gotten older, there's a level of infrastructure that we need to provide the volunteers, just, you know, basic setups like having Wi-Fi. Um, but at the same, you know, so this ability for people to, to encourage communication and, and, and inclusion has been critical. And then there's lots of great champions. You have to identify the people that are really good at connecting nodes and driving inclusion. We have a woman in the Drupal community who names Webchick. She won, uh, O'Reilly named her Open Source Contributor of the Year two or three years ago. And she's actually one of the least technical people I know, but she's amazing at getting people who know nothing about code to write documentation or getting people to show up at, uh, at meetups. You know, just this, you can do it too. I did it. I'm not a developer. And I can, you know, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And, you know, with a few of those people that are social by nature and enthusiastic, it propagates it. And then other people say, hey, I want to be like them. And, and so that's some of the ways in which Drupal thrive as a community. Hopefully that's helpful. Any questions? We know he has a question. Well, you have, uh, do you have the mic or? Oh. Ah. Uh, thanks for the demo. What was that system you showed us? Was it kind of Drupal as a, a server-side system, or did you, was it a client software? Well, uh, well I'm, I didn't hear that. The demo that you showed out, what, what was it? Oh, that was, uh, so that was uh, Drupal 7 running locally on my laptop on a, on a desktop stack. So yeah, so it was code. My solution architect built it, so there's lots of code in there that uh, I'll just break if I get too far into it. Any other questions? Hi. 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 Um, I saw your, uh, well, thanks for the fancy talk. I have a question for the demo. Uh, it looked like Drupal was all about clicking stuff together, but in the end you, you talked about a lot of books being written for Drupal. So I want to know what a Drupal is like for a real site developer from the perspective of a developer. Do you also end up clicking uh, stuff together or, I mean, how do you work with Drupal? Um, so, hmm. uh, I mean, I think, you know, some people, um, you know, will work directly in using Emacs and from the command line. Some people you work in Eclipse or Komodo, you know, from an IDE. Um, so don't get me wrong, developers are writing code for Drupal. They're writing their theming layer and their CSS and PHP there. They're writing custom integrations. You know, the, uh, the CTO for The Economist Somebody asked him about modules. They yeah, had 17,000 modules. That's great, but how good are they, right? And that's a problem. 
And not every module is going to be a fantastic module that's used on 10,000 websites and proven in sort of production environments. And so the attitude, his attitude was, look, they get me 80% of the way there for most of my problems. And I'd rather write the last 20% to make it unique to my environment, that makes it work for my application, than have to write the whole thing from scratch. And so, so, so that's what developers do. They live and breathe and, you know, understand the requirements, you know, me, you know, building out the site and then writing the code to simplify and get you to the finish line from the advanced starting points they do. Um, but that streamlines that process and allows, the other thing it allows, a lot of the partners, the development shops in the Drupal ecosystem had their own CMS. This is a story I hear over and over again. We wrote our own CMS and then we gave up on it and went with Drupal because our clients didn't want to pay us to build the next feature in our custom CMS. You know, hey, we want Twitter integration. Well, we don't have that, but we could do it. It only cost you $25,000 for us to build it. Right? And then what happens is, are they a professional services firm or are they a product development company? Right? Because two years ago, somebody paid you 25 grand to do Twitter integration, and now it's all buggy and doesn't really work. So you don't get to go update that unless they pay another 25 grand to update at that. So what that means is Drupal gives, instead of starting at the base layer here and have to write everything, Drupal gets you up here, and then you can focus on all the interesting stuff that frankly as developers is a lot cooler than doing sort of basic grunt work. There was a great article in O'Reilly where a, a guy was like, you know, I love Ruby, but I get sick of the, doing the same thing over and over in every single Ruby app. And Drupal abstracts that to another level so you can do things that are interesting. Is that fair? Sure. He's got the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is related to previous question. Uh, it's about uh, uh, Drupal strategy. So um, uh, you provide for the great IP, API for developers, application interface, and you allow them to uh, develop any module or any theme or any sp functionality uh, with Drupal. But uh, uh, what functionalities you plan to include in base package in several years? Maybe a uh, strong search, uh, maybe uh, some uh, e-commerce components, maybe some CRM components. Do you have plans for yep. dev include this base thing, maybe buy some modules, great modules uh, from the, your great partners or something like this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Sort of who's, how does the strategy evolve for what's included in Drupal core versus what's in the community contributed modules? Who's driving the future of this? And so, you know, and this is always a, a um, and said, our customers bought this, they want this, this is what we're going to build. Um, but in the community, you have to do it in a much more open fashion. And so what Dries has done, he's done surveys of the community and said, what are the key biggest pain points? What are the things people are most interested in? And use, you, has used that to drive um, priorities for Drupal. Um, he's also done a lot of community-led competitive analysis. So he brings... Drupal developers and they evaluate other systems, proprietary and open source, and say, what do they do well? Where, where are the gaps as Drupal competes against others for selection? And then they address some of those features. Or they look at some of the people that are using Drupal and say, you know, what are they talking about the most? Where are their biggest pain points? Um, so Drupal 8 is currently in development right now, and they actually have defined eight initiatives that are making up Drupal 8. So one is what we're calling the Whiskey Initiative, and it's a uh, web services initiative. And part of that is integrating Symfony, building the base uh, uh, PHP framework in Drupal to be Symfony, to be more object-oriented and also uh, simplify web service creation. Um, authoring experience is an important piece. Mobile first is an important piece. So I talked about Spark. Uh, configuration management. So a big, a big trend right now in the Drupal world is continuous integration. And the ability people want to push code live Anytime. They don't want to wait to, to you know, every, do it every three weeks or every two months. They want to push code live all the time. So you need to be able to support configuration as well as code changes to move it from dev to prod to stage and all those different places. So that's done in a very 